If you have your Bibles tonight, would you turn with me, please, to the book of St. John. I'm reading from the third chapter, verses 7 and 8, the words of Jesus. This is what he said. He said, Marvel not that I said unto you, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? The miracle of the new birth is also a mystery. I don't guess there is anyone in the world alive today or has ever lived that understands fully the miracle of the born-again experience. I don't know how God does it, but I know He does it, and I accept it. I guess I've learned more about it in the last six months than I have the rest of my ministerial experience put together. And what I have learned has literally cemented my salvation, anchored it. When Jesus uttered and used the term, He must be born again, Nicodemus, a master of the law, the Mosaic law that knew it, the proverbial inside and out, had never heard the term in all his life, born again. He didn't know what Jesus was talking about. And the reason he didn't was because there had never been a person born again. Saved, yes. Born again, no. There is a vast difference. On the other side of John, men were saved by looking forward to what was to come. God honored their faith, protected them, saved them. Don't worry about them. They're now with Jesus. But they did not know the born-again experience. They couldn't because Jesus hadn't died and hadn't gone to Calvary and had not risen from the dead. That's the reason that Nicodemus did not know, had never heard of the term in all his life. That's the reason he he, he answered foolishly. How in the world can a man enter the second time into his mother's womb? I want to use for subject, preaching a few minutes tonight, what happens in heaven when a sinner gets saved. What happens in heaven when a sinner gets saved? I don't know why God wanted me to preach this message here. He dealt with me about it a few weeks ago. And I really didn't want to preach it tonight, but he knows who's here and it's his service, it's not mine. What happens in heaven? We're going to tell you some things that could change your thinking altogether in regard to this great born-again experience the greatest thing that ever happened to a human being. What happens when a sinner gets saved? Bow your heads, please. Father, I thank you for your grace and your mighty love. We know that faith can fail. For you said to Simon Peter, I'll pray for you, Peter, that your faith fail not. We know that strength can fail. We know that wisdom can fail. But we know that love never fails. I ask tonight one thing, that I may preach this message as you would want me to preach it. That's all I ask. Help me not to say one single word that would hinder the flow of the Spirit. Not only do I pray for the anointing to preach, but I pray for the anointing upon these people that they may hear and receive this word that's able to save their souls. I'll ask in the name of Jesus, giving you praise and glory, and everyone said amen and amen. 
I think one of the most moving graphic scenes I've ever witnessed in all my life, I saw over television one night, over the news, Walter Cronkite, CBS. It was some years ago. I sat there and all of a sudden my attention was gathered totally when the governor of the great state of Tennessee, the cameras of CBS followed him into the Tennessee state prison. There were three men in that prison that had committed heinous crimes against society. They were murderers. They were condemned to die in the electric chair in the state of Tennessee in that prison just a few hours from the moment that I was watching that telecast. I watched the governor of the state of Tennessee walk up to death row. I didn't know what he was going to do. No one did. I suppose except the cameraman and the newsman. Three men stood there, all three black. One of those men must have been six feet tall. He must have been six four. He was a giant. He must have weighed 250 pounds and it didn't seem to be an ounce of fat on him. His shoulders looked like an oak tree. His arms bulged with muscles. He stood there, back of those bars, his life measured in hours. He was to die in the electric chair. The governor of Tennessee stood before the microphone addressing those three men, held a paper in his hand, and he read from this paper and said, these men will die or have been condemned to die at daylight in the morning in this prison. They are guilty of the crimes of which they are named. But I am commuting their sentence from death in the electric chair to life. They will not die. When he said that, it seemed like there was something that gripped that place. I watched those men to a man break and begin to weep. I watched that big giant of a man grip those bars with his hands and stood there open-mouthed for a moment. And finally he began to sob, great racking sobs as his body shook against that prison door. And as a tear streamed down his cheeks, he kept saying over and over again, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I sat there and wept, not just because of what I had seen, but the Holy Ghost quickened something in my heart. God the Father spoke to me and said, Son, just as those men were guilty and condemned to die, He said, You was condemned to die. You was guilty of the crime of sin against God. And he said, just a short time away from total spiritual death, my son Jesus Christ read that emancipation, of procl that proclamation, and he said, we commuted your sentence from death to life. And I want to tell you, brother, I, I said, That's, that, that typifies it. That explains it. That, that shows it in earthly terms, in just a moment's time, what this beautiful born-again experience is. But yet, I want to take you further than that. Most Christians today know absolutely nothing about their experience with God when it comes to being born again. They know that they're, they're saved, they'll miss hell and go to heaven, and that's just about the extent of it. Consequently, because they know very little, the devil uses this to discourage and to hinder and even make many Christians doubt their salvation. There are some of you in this audience tonight, you've lived a life of torment for the last days, weeks, or maybe even months because Satan has pounded you with doubt. He's told you you're not saved. You cannot know you're saved. You're not born again. Others may be, but not you. Because you've done this, you've done that. 
And these doubts have crowded your mind until your life has become a veritable torment. And there is no torment like the torment of being indecisive about your soul, my friend. And there is no peace like being able to lay on your pillow at night knowing that all is well between you and your God. I mean, that's the greatest thrill, my friend, that ever came to a heart in life. Money can't buy it. Gold and silver cannot purchase it. The kings of this world know nothing about it. Only Jesus Christ can give it. We know basically, basically what happens on earth when a person gets saved. Especially we Pentecostals. We shout about it and praise God for it. And we, we thank God for it. And, and that's good, but yet there's a danger in that. Now what in the world? You mean it's a danger in praising God? No, no, no. But listen to me. Let me finish. If you don't watch it, I'm just touching this. Is, this is not what I'm preaching about tonight. But I'm just touching it. If you don't watch it, the devil will gradually get you to the place that you base your salvation on what you feel. Now, I love to feel good. I love to sing these songs and something just flow all over me. And God can be felt. His presence can be felt. I love that. But I am not saved tonight because of what I feel. I'm saved because of what this old Holy Bible says about Jimmy Swaggart. That's the reason I know I'm saved. Praise the Lord. And once you begin to know and realize that you're happy all the time, jaw bells flood your heart all the time. Now, when you leave this place tonight, I want you to know more about your salvation than you've ever known since the beginning of your experience with God. I want you to know more about it, and you can. The first thing that happens when a person gets saved, when a life is changed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, when God made Adam, He made only one man. And in Adam's loins were all the most applied millions of the human race. That is why that when Adam sinned, that every soul ever born came under the penalty of that sin. Now, somebody may say, well, Brother Swaggart, it's not fair that people that never heard of Adam would, would, would be guilty. And they were not responsible for what he did. That is true. But yet, in Adam's loins were all the seed of the human race. And that's the reason whenever he became tainted, naturally the offspring of Adam was tainted. That's the reason we had to have a Savior. And that's what, that was the difference in Adam and the angels. When God made this human race, he did something that he had never done before. He gave man the ability to be a father. And that is a fantastic thing. Only God has ever been a father in the annals of creation. And he gave man, he didn't even give angels that privilege. When he made the angels, he made all of them at one time without number. The Bible said they are innumerable. No man can number the, the, the trillions of angels. Consequently, when Lucifer rebelled against God in the eons of ages ago, the angels that went with him, the angels that stayed with God, there was no need of a Savior to go and die on a Calvary for, for the angels. Because whenever a group sinned, the others were not tainted by their sin because they were all made at one time. Man was different. When man fell, every single human being fell. The first Adam lost it. And the second Adam, Jesus Christ, gained it back with his shed blood at Calvary's cross. Now here's a point I want you to get. We don't like to talk about it, but it ought to be talked about. Salvation is a legal transaction. We, we don't think of it in those terms. We think of it, well, the drunkard quits drinking, the prostitute quits selling her body, the gambler quits gambling, the thief quits stealing, and, and, and people quit living like hell. And we start to shout glory. But, and that's the result of it. That's not what salvation is. That's just the result of salvation. That's what happens when the change comes. 
But actually, salvation is a legal enactment. It had to be that way. There was no other way God could do it. He had to legally purchase man's redemption. He had to do it with a man. He couldn't do it with a goat. He couldn't do it with a lamb, a bull, or a turtle dove, or a pigeon. He could borrow time, but he could not wash away the stain. He had to use a man. I get a little bit angry when, when, when preachers so-called run around and say that Jesus, why yes, he did all of this, but he was God. He was God. Never forget it, he was God. If what he did could not have been done had he not been God. But everything he did, he did as man. That's what I want you to get. He did it as man. You see, he had to do it that way. If he hadn't have done it that way, the purchase would have been no good. He had to meet the devil on the devil's grounds as a man and say, all right, devil, throw everything that hell has got at me. And he said, I'll face it not as God, but I'll face it as man filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'll beat you on your own ground. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You say, what do you mean his own ground? This world belonged to Satan. It was his, lock, stock, and barrel. Jesus Christ came down here, stripped himself, the Bible said. I mean, he had power. He could have spoken a word and been surrounded by angels. He said it himself. Man, he could have just said the word, and the devil would have still been pummeling somewhere out there in outer space. But Satan knew he wouldn't do it because he couldn't do it and redeem man. But he stood up as man, and he bought back our redemption purchased it with his own blood glory be to the lamb of god as man for his blood was sinless mary was his mother but joseph was not his father he just raised him praise god actually he didn't do too much raising the holy ghost raised him praise the name of jesus and he died on calvary rose again the third day cleansed the heavenly utensils with his precious blood. And now when a man comes to him to be saved, it couldn't happen before this. The blood ran out of the temple in Jerusalem 24 hours a day, red down that brook Kedron, to try to push back the sins of the people. Not one person ever kept the law, not one. Every one of them broke it, except Jesus. But he went to Calvary, rose from the dead, and he did something, and this is what I want to give to you tonight. Now when a person comes to be saved, this is the first thing that happens in heaven. In the, the courthouse of heaven, if you can get this in your mind, I don't know if there's a courthouse there, but it probably is. In the courthouse of heaven, this is the legal transaction that takes place on the books. The first thing, you don't see it with your eye. You have to take it from the Word and it's there. The first thing that happens, you are forgiven. Now that's no big trick. Because me and you can do that with each other. You can curse men, I can forgive you. Peter became very adept at it. He said, Lord, seven times seven in one day? He said, seven times seventy, Peter, in one day. Forgive. But Jesus went a step further. Now this, this is what's so great. God had always forgiven men. But he had not been able to justify them. But now he justifies you when you get saved. Now that's a great big word, but I want to explain it. Romans chapter 5 verse 18. This is what it says. Therefore... As by the offense of one, talking about Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, meaning Jesus, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now what does that word mean? It means this. A judge can forgive a man, but he can't justify him. 
Justification means that whatever you were guilty of is wiped away and done away with as if though you never did it. You understand that? I mean, that old lie you told, you didn't tell it. As far as God's concerned, he just knocks the devil down with that. And Paul said it himself. He said, I've never wronged any man. I've never defrauded any man. I've never done this. I've never done that. And brother, I want you to know when that hit me, I thought, my Lord, he lied. He led them into the prison cells, thousands of Christians. They were slaughtered like animals. He almost wrecked the Christian church. And yet he said, I've never defrauded any man. How could he say that? By justification. Every last one of those old dirty things Paul had done was washed away. The books were clean. I want to tell you when the accuser Satan, we got a lot of people think that the devil's around here running around. He's not. He's up there in heaven. Right there at the throne accusing the brethren. Brother, I said that over radio and I got a thousand letters. I had a, I started to say what kind of denomination it was. I had a preacher get up and preach a sermon on me. I mean, he ran me. Who ever heard, he said, of the devil being in heaven? He's still there, friend. Got news for you. He's still there. Somebody said, well, he was kicked out. He was kicked out of his position and authority. But he still has the right to the access of the throne of God to accuse the brethren. Read the first chapter of Job. Revelation, it tells us, he accuses us. I mean, he's right there before that throne day and night watching to see if we do anything wrong. And to point it out to God the Father and say, here's what they did. Now, there's coming a day. Jesus himself said it in Revelation. He's going to be kicked out altogether. There's going to be war in heaven. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. And he's going to be kicked out totally and completely and it won't be very long. But Satan points it out and says, he told a lie. And Jesus turns to the day in question. And when at the judgment bar I stand before the king, and he the book will open, but he cannot find a thing, then will my heart be glad and tears of joy shall flow. For the old account was settled, was settled long ago. Justified. Glory to God, I'm justified. Don't that make the devil mad? I mean, everything you've ever done, every lie you've ever told, every old rotten, dirty thing, don't let the devil drag that junk up to you. I'm not giving you a license to sin, but if you have sinned, ask God to forgive you. Put it out of your mind. Don't remember it no more because God has forgotten it and you forget it too. My Lord, that's good preaching. Some of you have been dragging an old sin around with you for five years. I had a lady to come up to me some time ago. She was weeping and crying. I meant she had gone through hell. She said, Brother Swaggart, I committed the sin of adultery. And I mean, there is no sin any more despicable than adultery. Give me just a little more. And I, she said, I can't live with it. I'm dying. I'm going out of my mind. I said, have you asked God to forgive you? Yes. Have you done this terrible thing again? Oh, for God's sake, no. I said, well, God has not only forgiven you, but he's washed that thing clean. Now, wait a minute. Some of you are saying that Brother Swaggart, maybe he could do that with, with some little thing. But not that dread, black, rotten sin of adultery. The thing that's so remarkable about the blood of Jesus. Brother, it cleanses from all sin. Oh, hallelujah. All sin. I said, you've asked God to forgive you. Go and sin no more. Don't ever let it come to your mind. If the devil comes to you again and says, you did it, say, I didn't do it. Glory to God, I didn't do it. That's a lie. No, it's not. If it's a lie, Paul lied. Come on now. You see, you can say a lot of things with the gospel you can't say anywhere else. That's what born again means. Praise God, you're not the same man. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. All things pass away and all things become new. Does that give you license to sin? No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Just hold on here a second. Grace. What is grace? 
Grace, if you can explain it, it's unmerited favor. Now, theoretically, a person could sin a hundred times a day, and God would have to forgive that person if he came to him. Now, wait a minute, hold on. Some of you are saying, can't be. Oh, yes, it can. Yes, it can. Oh, Jesus lied. He told Simon Peter seven times seven in one day. That's 490 times. But the thing that is, when you get saved by the blood of the Lamb, you don't want to sin. It's not how much I can do and get by. My Lord, you don't want to do it. I don't want to drink. I don't want to gamble. I don't want to cuss. I don't want to do all of those things. Because I'm a new creature washed in the blood of the Lamb. Glory be to God and the Lamb forever. Some poor old soul, you know, says, well, well, aren't you a little bit sorry you didn't follow your cousins in entertainment? Dumb, dumb. <laughs> sorry. My Lord, brother, every one of us on this platform, and most of you, we're eating high on a hog, friend. My Lord, we've been made to sit together with Christ in heavenly places. Woo! Glory to God. I go to all the rock and roll shows I want to go to, just don't want to go to any. I drink all the booze I want to drink. I just don't want to drink any. If I got any drunker than I already am, only God knows how to act. I've never tasted of any kind of liquor in all of my life, but I stay drunk all the time. And I never wake up with a hangover. Well, glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know why? I'm justified. Glory to God. Justified. That's what makes it. He don't want you to know that, that he wants to drag all of these old things up there under the blood. Praise the Lord. Secondly, this is what happens in the courthouse of heaven. You, as a born-again new creature, the moment you're born again, you become righteous. Mm, we haven't heard that too much. Romans 5 and 17. Let's turn to it and read it. Romans 5 and 17. For if by one man's offense... Death reigned by one, Adam again. Much more they which receive abundance of grace. This is a beautiful scripture. And of the gift of righteousness. I just learned today that this thing is called the gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness. Shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. We have been taught all our life we are unrighteous. We are not righteous. People get up and pray and say, Lord, you know how unrighteous we are. If you are, you're not a Christian. Unrighteous. I'm glad I can look the devil right square in the eye and anybody else and say, Jimmy Swaggart is righteous. Come on, now that just stripped you, didn't it? Not because of anything I've done. Far from it but because of what Jesus Christ did at Calvary 2,000 years ago, I am righteous. I mean, He not only justified you, He made you righteous. And you know what righteousness is? It's the ability, the, the, the privilege of coming into the presence of God without guilt or condemnation. I mean, before Jesus came, men couldn't do that. They had to have a priest that would enter once a year to the Holy of Holies. By the tens of thousands, they would stand outside the tent. Little bells were around the priest garments. The bells were there to tinkle so the people could hear the tinkling of the bell and they knew as long as the bell were tinkling, the man was still alive. Because if anything was in his life, God would smite him on the spot. He was there to offer up a lamb, typifying Jesus that was to come. They couldn't approach God. They couldn't go into His presence. My God, they couldn't do it. But now, because of Jesus Christ, 
you and I can walk boldly into the throne room of grace. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Without guilt or con I went just this afternoon. I take a trip every day to the throne room. You know, I want to help you some. Just stop right here now. Just listen to me. As a Pentecostal, we Pentecostals have got some terminologies, brother, that are beautiful. When I was at high and we'd get in trouble, everybody would gather at the church and bombard the gates. <laughs> know what I'm talking about? We'd bombard the gates of glory. Did it for 25 years. One day the Lord spoke to me and said, What you doing? I said, well, I'm bombarding the gates. <laughs> he said, well, ding a -ling, you own them. <laughs> They're your gates. What are you bombarding your own gates for? Walk on through them. Walk on in. Sit right now. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And beside that, if it, if it was true, it's not. But if it was true, you could bombard the gates. You're still 750 miles from where you want to go. The Bible says the city is four square and it's 1,500 miles square. So if you're bombarding the gates, it thrones in the middle. You're 750 miles away. Never thought of that, had you? Oh, hallelujah. Oh, brother, when one day we walk through those gates of pearl, angels will stand at blank attention as we walk through and our feet upon solid gold and we walk into the throne rooms of glory because of what Jesus did at Calvary. Righteous, righteous, righteous. 1 Corinthians 5 and 21 says, He that knew no sin became sin, that we may become the righteousness of God in him get in your mind you're not only forgiven and justified but you are righteous my lord this is getting good third Luke 10 Luke 10 20 verse 20 your name is written down. Now, I want you to know I like this. Written down in the Lamb's book of life. Luke 10 and 20, Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Now, Jesus didn't just start this 2,000 years ago. The names have been written there ever since. In Exodus, it mentions names being written there. Revelation, it says that everyone that doesn't have their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be cast into the lake of fire. But when you get saved in the portals of glory, your name is written down in the books of, of life. And it's a legal thing. It's there. Uh, yesterday, we, we, we bought a piece of ground for the Jimmy Swaggart Evangelistic Association to put a radio transmitter on for our radio station in Baton Rouge. We have a 5,000 watt station. And the real estate agents and lawyers got everything together. They laid it on my desk. I mean there were copies and copies and copies of copies. And when I put my name on it, man, that sealed it. That was it. And I, 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 you know, I'd been praying for that for months, for years, really. And I looked at that and I almost shouted. There's something about it. It's a legal transaction. And get it in your mind, when you get saved, your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. My name's right there right now. Oh, hallelujah. Your name, if you're saved, is there right now. Tell the devil that every once in a while. My name's up there. Praise God. It's up there. It's written in God's book. Written by God's hand. My name is there. Woo! Glory. Hallelujah. I mean, it's no if or maybe so about it. My name's there. Your name is there. That's a thrill. A legal transaction. Jesus Christ sounded in there. Praise God. 
Now, this is what I want to tell you. Oh, it just thrilled me. God gave it to me and it just, just tore me open. I'll tell you this. The fourth thing that happens to you, Luke 12 and 8, this is what it says. Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. Matthew 10 and 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. That's the angels and that's the Father. Now here's what happens. You don't see it. You don't hear it. The Bible said there's rejoicing in heaven over every sinner that's saved. I want to tell you how that happens. Whenever a person, wherever that person may be, confesses Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior, up there in the portals of glory, Jesus Christ, before all the holy angels and before God Almighty, stands and shouts that person's name and confesses it before all of heaven. He says, James Black. And I want to tell you, when that name rolls out, the angels start to shout, and James Black has just come in. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thirty-five years ago, Jesus cried out, Jimmy Swaggart. And brother, all over heaven now, was shouting and shouting and shouting. And brother, I'm still shouting. You think of what I'm saying. You didn't feel that. You didn't sense it. You didn't see it. But when you were converted, born again, that's what happened. He said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father and all the holy angels. My Lord, they know you up there. Do you know that? I mean, when you got saved, it's not somebody looking around on some old dusty law books trying to find it. Praise God, the Master confessed you before all the portals of glory. My Lord, how, don't, that, don't that turn you on? Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> don't that make the devil mad? Don't you know he gets mad up there when he's up there and he hears another name roll out? Some of you parrots are here and your children are unsaved. If you keep believing God, they're going to come in. The devil's told you they'll never make it. But just a short time, that name, Susan Smith, is going to roll across the portals of glory. And Jesus is going to say, Devil, there's another one that's in. Washed in the blood of the Lamb, cleansed by Calvary's cleansing flow. My Lord, hallelujah. And the Bible said the angels shout and rejoice over even one sinner that gets saved. Can, can you, wait, wait, wait a minute, stop, 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 stop. I've got to say this. When you think of angels, you think of some 40 or 50. They are innumerable. I was reading in Revelation, I believe it's three. They were looking for one to open the book. Found no one that was worthy but Jesus. And the Bible said when he opened it, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands shouted with a loud voice. That's a loud bunch up there. Worthy is the Lamb. You know how many ten thousands times ten thousands and thousands of thousands are? It's a one with fourteen zeros behind it. Man, I, I thought I had it. I asked school teachers and everything else. Nobody knew. Finally one said, I figured it out, Brother Swaggart. It's a hundred billion. I jumped that high. A hundred billion. A hundred billion. I felt the same way. Wow. I was preaching the Illinois camp meeting. Mentioned that. Man came up to me at the service of Brother Swigert. I am Dr. So and so. I got his name in my office. Fine man. He said, In just a few hours I will have my doctorate. You'd already had it in something else. In mathematics. You were wrong tonight. 
He told me a lot of long words that pertain to that 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. He said, it's not a hundred billion. My feathers fell. I said, Lord, I didn't mean to exaggerate. He said, oh, you didn't exaggerate. You understated it. It means a hundred trillion. I jumped that high. Oh, glory. Can you think of a hundred trillion angels shouting out your name? Shouting because you've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. Born again. Lastly, Romans 8 and 16. Paul wrote this. 8, 16, 17, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God. And joint heirs with Christ. Now I want to tell you, that says something, friend. Jesus is my elder brother. Anything I want, I can have it. That's what he said. I get up every morning, and the devil says, Oh, God, boys, he's up again. Some of you get up and say, I don't know how in the world I'm going to face another day. Come on now, you with me? I like to get up and, and, and say, God is in me. That's what the book said. John said, Ye are off God, little children. Paul said that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm an heir of God. I'm a joiner. I get so sick of Christians running around acting like they're nothing. They think they're just about that. Let me tell you, if it wasn't for you, this whole world would have gone to hell a long time ago. You're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Do you understand that? Get it out of your mind that you're nothing. The Bible said the world is not even worthy to have the children of God. We're the salt of the earth. That doesn't mean we're to run around now with our nose up there. Don't misunderstand me. But you ought to realize who you are. You are the, you are the glue that's holding this thing together. You are the power in this whole world. When you're taken out, won't be anything left worth leaving here. I, I get tired of Christians. You know, we've been taught all our lives, what a worm am I. Come on. We look at governors and senators and congressmen. Oh, my Lord. Am I, you, you, you're a thousand times more important to this world than they are. I had to have something done the other day. I asked a lawyer in Washington, I said, what do I do? He was a lawyer. He said, you got to get some political help. I said, well, who? He said, well, get the biggest man in the state of Louisiana. I said, well, that's got to be Senator Russell Long, United States Senator. I said, all right. I called the man. I said, you know him? He said, yeah, I do. I said, well, tell him to call me. He's been a senator for 20 years. Are you crazy, Swagger? No, you are. It's no honor for me to talk to him. My Lord, he, he couldn't do anything. I found that out quick. Don't put that on that table. <laughs> the book still says, Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. It's an honor for him to talk to me, not because I'm somebody big. It's an honor for him to talk to you. You are a blood-washed child of God. You are a child of God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. An heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Everything he has, you've got it. I said, have him call me. That lawyer said, you are crazy. United States senators don't call nobody.
He said, man, you won't even get his age to call you. Senators don't, especially if they've got 20 years seniority. I said, well, we'll see. Three o'clock that afternoon, my secretary buzzed my desk. She said, Brother Swagger, Senator Russell Long's on the line. What is it talking to piggly little old sinner when you talk to Jesus every day of your life? <laughs> Glory to God. My Lord, once you sit beside the throne for a little while, everything else seems a little mundane. Praise the Lord. Let me, let me close this. I preach all night long. Don't tempt me. That's what happens in heaven. You become a joint heir. God says now, put him in line. <laughs> He's going to inherit the whole thing. Somebody said, won't they run out after a while? Run out. I was just praying the other day, you know, and crying to God. I was desperate, God, and you've got to do it and do it now. He stopped me and said, quiet down. He said, furthermore, sit down. I sat down. He said, you're acting like whatever you're after is running out. Go down to the Mississippi River. I live about eight miles from it, Baton Rouge. Take the biggest tub you can get, pack, dip into the river, get all the water you can get, and see how much the river falls. You see, it's a mile wide where I live. He said, just dip in and get all you want or whatever you're asking for. And said, don't worry, there's plenty left. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Let me close. You know, my when my daddy built a church years ago, I was just a boy, teenager. It was the place I found my wife. And built a great church. He stretched a tent in a little old area that it was about the meanest, roughest, wildest, dirtiest, rottenest area in that part of Louisiana to build a church. God said, go there. I, I remember when he told my mother and myself, I cried. I said, not that place, you know, not there. Please, God, not there. But God, Daddy said, God said, that's where to go, and he went. God does that. He wants his light to shine in dark places. That revival under that tent lasted for weeks. It changed the lives eventually of thousands of people. A church was built that became the largest community church in the entire state of Louisiana. And in that community, this is what I want to tell you. I want to show you now back to earth what happens when a person gets born again. In that community were two main families. My sister married one of the men. One family named Ensminger of German extraction, and the other named Huber, also of German extraction. They were as wicked, I mean, they were mean wicked, mean men. The Hubers, there were five brothers, Bob, Jack, Sam, Ben, and Dick. Five brothers. Bob Huber is six feet six inches tall, 285 pounds. And in those days, his stomach was like this concrete. He was on the police force in Natchez, Mississippi. A few months before my dad stretched that tent to build a church. Billy Ensminger and Dick Huber were inseparable. They were first cousins. You saw one, you saw the other. Both men would get dragging, falling down drunk night after night. They lived that way. They knew nothing about God. They would curse each other, knock each other down, big 
powerful men. Get back up as drunks oftentimes will do, throw their arms around each other, go their respective ways. One night the cursing became more profane. The slurs more pronounced. Drink drugged the brains of both men. Billy Insminger pointed his finger drunkenly at Dick Huber and said, I'm going to kill you. Huber followed him home, cursing him. Both men so inebriated they hardly knew they were in the world. Not knowing what he did or was doing. Billy Insminger went into his house, got a double barrel shotgun, and while his wife and children screamed, and Dick Huber's wife and children begged him to leave Billy alone, Billy Insminger put that shotgun to his shoulder, pulled both hammers and pulled both triggers, and it blew Dick Huber's stomach all over that road. He died laying on the bridge. His children almost lost their mind. Murder is a horrible thing. When the judge sentenced Billy Insminger to Angola prison, he stood before that judge and the judge said, if you ever get out of jail and you come back in this country, I or any law enforcement agency will not be responsible for your life because Sam Huber, Ben Huber, Bob Huber, and Jack Huber had sworn to kill him. Jack Huber became the biggest housing contractor in the state of Mississippi, built thousands of homes, millionaire several times over. They swore to kill him. They were men that would do what they said they would do. In the midst of this hate, festering hell, my daddy began to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Billy and Sminger was out of jail. The Hubers hired the best gunmen. They blew the windshield out of his car's bullets creased his skull several times. They would send men hundreds of miles if they knew where he would be. They hunted him like an animal. You never saw Sam Huber, but there was a bulge under his coat as a shoulder holster held a thirty-eight. He meant to kill Billy Insminger. Bob Huber lived and breathed killing Billy Insminger. Vengeance and hate will eat you up for there's nothing left. Bobby Huber, when they needed a nightclub cleaned out in Natchez, Mississippi, they didn't send a pl platoon of policemen. They sent one man. They sent Bob Huber. He could kill a man with one hand. He did it in the Battle of the Bulge in Germany in 1944 in the Argonne Forest. He could kill you with one hand. Squeeze the life out of your neck. 285 pounds of bone and muscle. A giant of a man. One night, Ben Huber, also six foot six, 275 pounds. I'll never forget that night. Saturday night. Walked down those aisles and said, God, you can have the hate and the vengeance. I'm sick of it. I want you to come into my heart. And Jesus changed it. Big Bob Huber heard his brother had gotten religion. That's the way he put it. He laughed at first. It was a joke, you know. 
But Ben kept after him. Ben lived a little ways down the church from the church. Precious man. God changed that roaring lion hate until he was a, one of the meekest men I ever knew. He kept after him to come, and Bob drove from Natchez, Mississippi to Wisner, Louisiana, a little small, small country village where our church was. And I remember that night, we had, for whatever the reason, a Saturday night service, and then Sunday morning, Sunday night, plus Wednesday night. Bob walked in, sat down. I've watched God deal with a lot of men, but God dealt with that big man. He sat there and shook and cried and wouldn't go. Left out after church. Brother, I want to tell you, when the high sheriff of heaven gets on your trail, you don't shake it off with a bottle of beer or another dirty joke. You hear me? If anything the church needs, that's what it needs today. Bob Huber walked the floor like a cage lion for a week. Slept very little, eat very little. Sunday afternoon, he told his wife Hazel, he said, it was a week later, do they have a church in Natchez? Like we went to Saturday a week ago. She said, I don't know. But I'll look in the phone book and see. She said, I think it was assembly or something or the assembly of God. They found it. He said, get the kids ready, let's go. They walked in that church. They were in revival. And Bob told me, I guess, 50 times. He said, Jim, when they started singing, Lord, I'm coming home. He said, God, you can have the 38. You can have the hate. You can have it all. I'm coming home. God saved him. Sam was saved just a short few days later. Bob Huber, I heard him tell it many times. He lived next door to me for a long time. He's preaching the gospel tonight. He said, Jim, I laid down three packs of cigarettes a day. Quit. It's like that. I could drink a man under the table, laid the beer and the wine and the whiskey alone. Left alone. Never touched another drop. No problem. The lust, I live like an animal. He said, gone. But he told me, he said, there's one thing that worries me. He said, I don't know what I'll do. He said, I believe I have it controlled. He'd tell my dad, he'd tell me. But if I ever meet Billy Insminger face to face, the man that shot my brother down in cold blood, I don't know what I'll do. Daddy told him, said, just cross that bridge when you get to it. God will work it out. It was a Saturday morning, about 9 o'clock. I was over at the parsonage. We were in the living room, Dad and myself. Bob's new Chevrolet drove up. He jumped out, left the motor running, never even closed the door. He didn't knock. He didn't ring a doorbell. He came like a man possessed in that front room. He was crying and laughing and shouting. And I want to tell you, brother, somebody said, well, you, what do you do with a man like that? Six feet, six inches tall, 285 pounds. You just let him do what he wants to do. You don't bother him. He goes where he wants to go. He was praising God and crying and Bob, what is it? He's one of these kind, you know, you just meet him, you like him. What is it? And he finally sat down about 15 minutes, and me and Daddy just sitting there looking at him. Finally, we joined him. We didn't know what we were shouting about, but just joined him. He said, Brother Swagger, he said, Bob, I thought you was going to be out of town today. He said, yes, I was supposed to be, but I changed my plans at the last minute. He said, this morning I went over to his, his first cousin's home, my lady. Everybody thought Bob was out of town. All the brothers had gotten saved except Jack, and Jack had just about made it. And Billy and Sminger wasn't really scared of any of them now except Bob. Big, 
Bob Huber. And he'd heard Bob was going to be out of town. He was coming to tend to some business and was going to get out before Bob got back. And Bob saw the car there and didn't know whose it was. He said, Jim, I did something I've never done in my life. He said, I went around to the back. He said, I've never gone around to her house at the back. But said, for some unknown reason, I went around to the back. And he said, I did something again I've never done in my life. He said, I never knocked on the door, never rung a doorbell. Just opened it and walked in at about 8 o'clock in the morning. And he said, when I walked in the door, now I'm talking about getting born again now. I'm not talking about this handshaking type, you know. I'm talking about something that changes your life. Jesus does it. He said, when I opened the door, I stared Billy Insminger right square in the face. The lady backed against the wall and said, oh my God. And Billy Insminger, his face as white as my shirt, backed up against the wall. He knew he was going to die. I said, Bob, what did you do? He said, I stood there. And he said, I looked him out in the eye, six feet from him. And the devil said, there's the man that murdered your brother. That made his children orphans. That put his wife through hell. There he is. Kill him. He said, I looked at my hand and he could have squeezed the life out of him with one hand. 285 pounds, six feet, six inches tall. And the devil said, kill him. I said, what'd you do, Bob? He said, I said, Jesus, help me. Glory to God. And he said, Jim, it was like something just came all over me. Instead of a fist, he walked over, put his arms around the man that was his own first cousin that murdered his brother, put his cheek next to his, and said, Billy Ensminger, I love you. Let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. Tonight, Billy and Springer lives next door to Sam Huber. Only God could do that. That's what Jesus said. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. All things become new. Justified. Righteous. Name in the Lamb's book of life. Confessed before heaven. And join heirs with Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Take your burdens to the Lord. Leave them there. Thank you, Jesus.
This old world is shaking, neighbor. It's coming to the end swiftly. Jesus is coming. There's only one refuge. There's only one ark of safety. There's only one red cord of redemption. Just one. That's Jesus. No other way. You ask me why I'm happy. That's the reason why. How many in this audience tonight, Brother Swaggart, I'm not saved. I'd like to have this, what you've talked about, that can change a man. Make his life over again. Would you pray for me? I will not embarrass you or give you my word. But I don't want you to leave this place until Jesus calls your name in heaven and announces it to God the Father and to all the holy angels. He's ready to do it. The Holy Ghost is ready to bring him the message. For he's dealing with you right now. How many... Hast thou not known me when I stand and I knock? Can you not hear? Amidst the jangle of this world, do you not know? If you will only open, I will come in. And I will right the wrongs, dissolve the evil, cleanse you of every stain. For I love you with a godly love for your mind. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. How many in this audience tonight, Brother Swaggart, I'm not a Christian, I'm not saved. Would you pray for me? If you want the greatest deal that God ever gave any man, you can have it tonight. Would you slip up your hand right now? Pray for me. I will not embarrass you. I give you my word. Pray for me. I'm not saved. Let me see that hand. There's a hand. There's a hand. There's a hand. There's a hand. Another hand. Another hand. How many more? Another hand, sir, I see it. How many more? Another and another. Up in the balconies, how many? Pray for me. Another hand, another hand. I see them. Another, another, another. How many more? God that changed a hate-filled fanatic by the name of Saul made him into the greatest apostle of love that man has ever known and changed his name to Paul can do the same for you Ray would you play it love lifted me what we sung tonight I want everybody to stand please hallelujah play that verse I was sinking so deep in sin far from that peaceful, peaceful shore. I was so very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the Master of the sea heard my despairing cry I want every one of you that raised your hands tonight I want to pray for you these pastors want to pray for you 
We're not here to get you to join a certain church. No. We're not here to scream in your ear, beat on your back, just to point you to Jesus. He alone can say. And I want you to come. Stand right here. We'll make room for you. It'll be the greatest step you ever took. The greatest move you ever made. As we sing it, come on right now.